introduce uh, the person who put this program together. This was kind of his brainchild, Mr. David Super. David graduated from Sturgis High School here and then barely worked in, uh, <laughs> in the journalism industry for a while and went away for about 30 years and recently returned a couple years ago and has become a real active member in the historic uh, memories of this community. So I'm going to turn the program over to him and David will introduce the other folks participating. Welcome again, everyone. I'm a classmate from 1965. Like, yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, I guess living proof that I did finally pass the English proficiency test. And so uh, uh, and here I am, 50 some odd years later, back home in Sturgis. Uh, ginning up the idea for this program. As Mark introduced, this historical society is the entire history of the town and the county. Today we're talking about racing, and in a few more months, we're gonna be talking about the stained glass windows of the Presbyterian Church. So, the sky is the limit for topics. We all, we welcome your ideas, your input, and the like. We think that we live in a town that has a very rich cultural and social history, and we don't want to let that get away from us uh, while we're still able to talk about it, collect it, and share it with everyone else. And so that's, that's a real focus of what we're doing here today, and racing is the topic of this afternoon. So I want to thank also the staff of the Knuckle for allowing us to gather here today. Uh, we certainly appreciate being indoors on a, on a day that's not too cold outside, but you sure can't do a program like this out on Alkali Road. It would be a little uh, awkward in December to do something like this. So my thanks to the folks at the Knuckle as well for helping us out. Uh, Jim Holland, another Sturgis guy, who's just an infant compared to me. <laughs> which, which class? 1974. So any 74? Uh, too young. Too young. Uh, Jim's been a newspaper reporter for virtually all of his adult life in, uh, here in Western South Dakota and part in Nebraska. And so he's here to share his knowledge with us as well because he's the real car guy here. Oh, wait a minute. I, I played in the high school band. And so and my parents had a rambler car. It would have been humiliating for me to be anywhere other than right at the band room or back home. Certainly not on Alkali Road. So to begin our discussion here this afternoon, I'll just remind those of you who may not be old, old time Sturgis folks that we're standing on pretty much the garage floor of the Black Hills Implement Company. And so Mr. Bob Burnham and his sons Jerry and Tom, uh, like many of you who are in this room, born with wrenches in their hands and feeler gauges and all of that stuff from a, a while ago, uh, a good bit of it's here. So under our feet and our butts here today is the sweat and the grease and the transmission fluid and probably some blood from uh, the mechanics who work in this garage as well. I know as a teenager, when cars were just a, a mystery to me, uh, Gerald Langan was a very patient person with me and some of the rest of us dumb kids to explain how fuel injection works and how disc brakes work. And later on in my career, when I was working in Washington, D.C., and I had a military assignment, I heard about acoustic weapons. And I thought, geez, what are those things? On. And then I remember getting sick to my stomach riding in the back seat of Gary Patterson's 58 Chevy you know, on Main Street. That was an acoustic weapon. <laughs> uh, I don't know how fast it went, but uh, it had an impact on me. So that's part of what we're talking about here today. And you know, going back as far as the invention, the promotion, the sale of the Rocket 88. Oldsmobile engine, which a lot of historians credit with being the starting point for kind of modern day ra racing. V8 engine, overhead valves, lots of horsepower, ethyl gasoline, 
all those things that contributed to making that that engine popular, making those cars go fast. And so, beginning with that, by 1964, the GTO is on the marketplace for 3,000 bucks or less. Okay. You could buy one of those cars. Now that was out of my price range, but I think there's probably a few guys here in town that uh, you know, sell one steer by a GTO or whatever cattle prices were in those days. Um, and make all of that work. And then, the, so why was racing side by side, informal drag racing possible and popular here in the Sturgis area, elsewhere of course as well? Well, if you do a little historical research on all of this, we can blame it on the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> and they get blamed for all kinds of stuff these days, so we can blame all of that on the Russians. The Cold War resulted in the establishment of the Titan missile base sites here in Western South Dakota to start with. And so it was Department of Defense money that allowed for the first rebuilding and paving of the Alkali Road. In, in those days, the county identified that strip of highway as Defense Road. And so it was eight miles of federal money, like we're all like, I'm strickling in here to the western South Dakota that paved that highway for the first time and provided this tantalizing place for a few of you fellas to, uh, who didn't have to drive their dad's ramper, uh, <laughs> to go out there and, and test to see just how fast they could go and how good of drivers they were and how good of good teachers they were. And you know, here we are all today talking about it again. So hopefully that's part of what the conversation will be with us here today. So I want to start down to the next slide, please, Jim. So here's here's just a, a reminder, if you haven't been out there recently, of uh, where the Alkali Road strip is in front of the Kenoyer Burge place, where the uh, Stephen Gas Threshing Bee is today. There were many other straight stretches of highway in the region that were used for racing. Uh, this is the one I think that probably was as well known as any of them. Uh, but uh, there was a stretch along the Whitewood Road. Further down this road, down by the Titan site, there was another piece of uh, straight highway that was used for racing. There's Aztec Hill in the Lee Deadwood area. Um, there's uh, Highway 16 in Rapid City, Mount Rushmore Road. You, you challenge, you showed your, your oats down on 8th Street, because that's where the girls were, and all that, and then you went up the hill to race uh, to prove how much of a man you were. And so that's part of, of the whole magic of all of this. Um, and then later on, there got to be drag strips in the area and the like, but this was the start for here. So next slide. So here's the place. Uh, today, that from curve to curve, it's two and a half miles. It's dead straight, pretty darn flat. Uh, it's still a good place to race. Uh, I think if you went out there this afternoon and could somehow do a DNA test on the black marks that are on the highway, you'd find that that, that tire rubber was put down there last week, you know, or last night, maybe. So people are still going out there testing horsepower and, and equipment. On the tables, and I've got some more here as well, there's a handout that is a very incomplete and probably inaccurate list of drivers and cars. We invite you, please, with a pen or a pencil, make additions or corrections to those papers. Give them back to us. It's like school. We're going to collect the papers at the end of the program. Bring them back to us, and we'll consolidate all of that information so that we can have as correct a list as we possibly can. And then that all just becomes part of the archive that is uh, a growing part of the Sturgis Bee County Historical Society. Be available on our website and in other places, the, the public library and elsewhere. My long, long range goal is that somebody's great granddaughter that's in this room, a kid not born yet, 
will be in high school here in Sturgis 50 years from now. Yeah. Teacher, what can I write a term paper about? I'm interested in history. Well, here's a week. Tonight, this afternoon, we're going to write the guts of the term paper for some historian 40 or 50 years from now. Try that up, sir. Is this better? Oh, I know it is. It's a little easier for me. <laughs> so that's that's part of what we're doing here. Go ahead to the next one. And there's even one more. Of, uh, so if you would please help us make this list as complete as possible. And when Jim and I have finished our talking today, and we're going to invite you to tell some some uh, street stories uh, as well to the rest of the crowd while we're going to we'll be taking notes and gathering up this information and pulling it all together so that we can have a, as complete a story as we possibly can Go ahead. okay so i got a series of pictures and there are precious few pictures that i was able to get a hold of and i'm hoping that others i'm hoping that others will come through their images as well of cars and races and the like. These pictures were taken by Linda Knoyer Burge, another classmate from 1965, on an Easter Sunday in 1966. And so when you when you look at some of these pictures here, you'll see people that are kind of dressed up. So they came right from church to uh, the next room, which is so it's only fitting uh, here, here when we come. So uh, I, some of the people you can recognize in these pictures, uh, on the far right is uh, John Steves, the, the husky guy in the brown coat. The gal in the brown coat on the very far right edge of the, of the margin is uh, Kay Pruitt. Uh, and there's some other pictures that we'll show here in a minute. Uh, where we can see some other recognizable faces. So there's Wayne uh, in his car. And if you look real closely there, he had uh, modified the exhaust system there. The, the headers were opened up with that car. And you can see them. So uh, next slide, Jim. This is Rusty Robert. Is Rusty here today? I had a nice visit with him the other day, and he brought me up to speed on uh, the lead deadwood scene of uh, what took place up there. And uh, he had a Corvette when he was in high school. So, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, and look at the gas prices there. And uh, this was this was probably, this picture was taken in 1966 or 67 when he graduated from high school. And so gasoline was, uh, I haven't yet hit uh, 40 cents a gallon in Lee Bedwood. Here's another race. Uh, and we'll have these, these pictures available after the program. You can come up and look more closely and see some recognizable faces there. Uh, the late Dennis Bike is in the back somewhere. Um, and, and others. But we don't know whose car this is. This is a mystery to us so far. So this is more of the historical research that will go on here today. And uh, two people are here today that are in this picture. Uh, Joe Plenbeck. That's you, Joe. It's, it's got to be you. <laughs> That's Joe. And I think Kip. I was never out there. <laughs> <laughs> are you next to Joe? Your hands in the it, was, it was March, it was a cool day when that picture was taken, so. Uh, and we, we don't know whose uh, who's hot rod that is, uh, but it's got, it's got two or maybe three, you can't see the whole engine, uh, at least dual carburetors. Uh, so. <laughs> Next. And here's another, another race with some more faces that you can see. Uh, I look more closely at this picture, guys, like David Sundstrom uh, is in, in one of these pictures. Okay, and it, it's interesting how you can look at these, these young men and just by their posture, 
you know, if you went to school with them, you know who they are. You know, and so, uh, okay, yeah, next year. With the help of several of the people that I talked to, we made a short list of things that the racers were doing to their cars in the 1960s. By all means, this isn't a complete list, but it's some of what was possible and affordable in those days, and probably still allowed you to drive your car to school, or to work, or to the movies on the weekend with your girlfriend. So uh, those were the things that were available. I, I had a, a long visit with Terry Mays, and he talked about the gear ratios in cars, and that how uh, he knew that in their highway patrol car, they couldn't catch anybody trying to run them down in town because uh, you'd always get a, the drivers would always get away from the patrolman. But he felt confident that out of the highway, uh, there was a more even playing field. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, that's the word for Terry. Okay. So this one, I just, I've uh, labeled this the royal opposition. So for the Sturgis area, it was Floyd Cullen, Terry Mays, and up at Deadwood, Clyde McHugh, there were sheriffs and sheriff's deputies. I think game wardens were uh, pressed into service from time to time to write tickets uh, and the like. And the, uh, in talking to Terry about their cars, I don't know how many of you here uh, or what versions of the story you have, but I know that growing up, we all had this kind of understanding that, that Floyd, that Floyd Cleland's patrol car was customized, that he used his own money to make it go faster and the like. So I asked Terry that question. Now Floyd isn't with us anymore, so he can't defend himself. But Terry said it was all a myth, and we highway patrolmen were pleased to encourage that myth. <laughs> Under the hood of every highway patrol car, there was, there was another, oh, it's going to work again. Okay, there was another thousand dollars worth of uh, spare parts and enhancements to the car. Harry did say that when, in the years that they drove Plymouths, there was a little less than a dollar uh, change that they could make to the linkage to the carburetor. And instead of relying on a vacuum mechanism to open up the back barrels of the carburetor, they could put a screw somewhere in the linkage that became then a mechanical trip for the back barrels of the carburetor. And he said that was the only that was the only modification that they made to their Plymouth cars and that was allowed by the fleet managers of the highway patrol as well, their bosses, uh, who wouldn't uh, allow them to you know, win money on the side or, or whatever it was, dig into their own pockets to customize their cars. You gents in the audience today may have ways to verify other versions of that story, but that's what I got from Officer Mays, uh, who's uh, comfortably in retirement these years in Rapid City. So, but he talked about their, the Plymouth cars that they had, uh, and then that yielded over to the Galaxy 500 Fords that they drove, as Terry described it to me, it was, uh, he said, it was just a taxi cab with a big motor. And uh, one of the things that the highway patrolman didn't like about the Fords is that the AM radio antenna was on the left fender, real close to the windshield. And when they worked their spotlights, um, that would reflect back on them. So they all had to camouflage their radio antennas with black tape, uh, another low-tech fix uh, that was allowed for their cars. Uh, Air conditioning came along in 1964 for the Highway Patrol. That's way earlier than I thought. But uh, anyway, that uh, made the car more comfortable for them, I guess. And other than that, I think back in that year, if you opened up the trunk of one of those Highway Patrol cars, it was still kind of the piece of, uh, of a haymow rope and a gas can, which is sort of the way the Highway Patrol started out. And, uh, but they didn't carry a great deal of equipment. Their radios were, when Terry and Floyd were working, they were single channel radios, and to talk car to car, they had to call State Police Radio in Rapid City and ask permission 
to, so if you wondered why you got away one Saturday night, it's because they were in a party line and they couldn't radio for help until they got permission from Fred Schick uh, at State Police Radio in order to make that work. Well, you could out, you could out run the radio in those days. And uh, eventually they got two channel radios. Uh, and nowadays, of course, the communication suite that's in the patrol car is, uh, you know, they can look at Facebook when they should be working. So, uh, and, uh, so next one. Now, just a little, a little side story from the help from April Bike Stoner and Kenny Bike, who's in the back of the room this afternoon. Uh, I went out to the bike wheat farm about a month and a half ago, and we looked and we looked and we looked and we finally found this car. And this is a 1938 Chevrolet Coupe that was first to customize as an ice racing vehicle that Kenny Grove or your friends did uh, in Custer on Stockade Lake when there was ice racing on Stockade Lake. And then the car got brought back up here to the bike uh, homestead area, the farm area out east of town. And Martin and Dennis got this car and they cut the top out of it so the gutter could have a 360 degree field of fire when they were shooting rabbits or whatever else it was that uh, they shot at. And according to the story from April, and I'm going to believe April, that when this car had about one more engine start left in its body, Dennis and Martin, and regrettably those two gentlemen are gone now, so we can't verify the story, but those two young men, who April says were constantly in trouble for doing something, they got some mattresses out of the bunkhouse, and they lined the inside of the cab of this coupe, and like uh, Thelma and Louise, or I, I like to say like a Viking funeral, they were going to take this car for one more ride, which they did. And we don't know which cousin was at the wheel, but padded with these bunkhouse mattresses, they drove it off the edge of the wheat field and down into the ravine, and she sits there today, uh, just slowly going back into the earth. Next, next slide. So that's a little bit of what's left there. This particular car, uh, as an ice racer, uh, still, it had the stock engine, but it, it had been modified uh, with dome pistons. Am I saying that right? They're called high dome pistons. High dome pistons in, in order to make it go faster. So, uh, and surprisingly few bullet holes. But it's it's way way out there too. We had a we had a tickets of a time finding that vehicle. So uh, those of you that are aviators, the next time you're out flying over Reed County, why take a look at this and you'll see where it is. So. Um, but, 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 so yeah, this was Martin's place. The other car that the bike family had, and I can remember riding in when Martin would bring it into town, was their 52 DeSoto convertible. And Kenny uh, filled me in on that, and he's got a picture of it that he's, uh, he'll show you. Uh, it was one of 850 52 DeSoto convertibles made. So it was a relatively rare car even back then. This particular vehicle was the getaway car for a couple of bank robbers in Minnesota. They robbed the bank in Minnesota. They got the car all the way to Custer before they either got caught, broke down, something happened to them anyway, and the car became then the property of Custer County. And uh, eventually the buyers were able to buy the car and eventually that DeSoto convertible made its way to Sturgis, where all good old cars need to go. You know. They all end up here. And uh, kind of the promised land for hydrocarbons you know, are, are here in Meade County and in Sturgis. And Martin would drive, and Dennis would drive that car to town every now and then. And we high school kids would pile in and ride around in it. Not necessarily because we wanted to ride in a 52 DeSoto convertible, but mostly because the bike cousins made homemade beer. <laughs> and, and they would bring that beer to town, and the, the, the signature of bike beer was there was a raisin in every bottle. And 
Martin would be a generous man, I tell you, just, just a good friend. I, I'm sad that he's not with us anymore, but Martin would he'd open them up and he'd pass them around to us and we'd all take little sips and we'd drink. When you're 16 years old, you want to drink the whole bottle and have another one. And we were sipping on this, and it was powerful uh, stuff. And, uh, and then he would always ask, well, are you ready for another one? You know? And the standard answer for us bandy bandy guys that were in the band or the debate team was, oh, I haven't gotten to the raisin yet. And so I don't think I ever finished a five beer. But uh, that was part of the fun of riding around in that old soda. And uh, it finally went off into car heaven. And so uh, we don't have pictures of it anymore today. So this sets the stage with a little bit about what drag racing was like uh, out on the strip there. <coughs> Typically racing from east to west um, with people blocking traffic on either side as necessary to, to make it safe for everyone. Uh, Terry did confirm for me that in all the years that he and his colleagues were chasing after uh, informal drag racers. He could remember no time where there was ever an accident or any kind of serious mishap uh, in all of those years of, of racing. I didn't mean there weren't breakdowns, disappointments, maybe a little money lost for one on the side, but otherwise it was a pretty uh, straightforward uh, bit of 60s and early 70s vintage competition amongst uh, uh, fellows that were uh, interested in cars and making their cars go fast. And, uh, and some of them did. Uh, 100 miles an hour wasn't impossible uh, in those days at the, at the far end of the strip. That last little squeak of uh, spinning tires, that rubber in the fourth gear kind of thing, and at the other end of it, uh, before you came to the airport turn, you were going 100 miles an hour, it's time to slow down. So, uh, and two more drivers would line up and take a spin at it. One other unexpected nugget of information that I got for doing my research, I called my college classmate friend and, and stirred this guy, Ron Barker, for those of you that remember the Barker family. Uh, there was Dwayne, the oldest, the twins, Phil and Phyllis, and Ron. And uh, Ron had a 64. Impala Supersport. And I've gone in an automobile, I've gone more than 100 miles an hour as a passenger in just two cars. And one of them was Barker's Supersport, and the other was Marshall Williams' dad's Falcon. <laughs> on, on the downhill where the uh, truckway station is now, uh, we were going to Rapid City one night, and Marshall wanted to impress us with how fast his dad's Falcon would go. And we were at pretty fast in that little car. So, but anyway, in talking to Ron about his car, and I asked if he ever raced his car there um, amongst you guys. And I sensed for Ron at least, uh, who's a, he, he lives a substantially different lifestyle today than he did when he was 20 years old or 21. Um, that uh, he didn't race there necessarily, but he did challenge his brother one time, Phil, to a race, and then he challenged his brother-in-law. Now, those of us who are class of 65 students here remember the trauma in the high school when Charles Thielen moved to Rapid City and left us choir kids with a new teacher. And how could we, how could that, could Chuck Phelan ever be replaced? Well, the school board replaced him with Stanley Wright. And poor Mr. Wright, if, if there was ever a teacher in the school system here who earned every penny of his paycheck, his rookie year teaching in the system, I think it was Stan Wright. Uh, we ate him up one side and down the other and frontwards and backwards and whatever. Stanley Wright went out with his brothers in law, uh, the Barker boys, and did some runs in his Rambler Ambassador. <laughs> so uh, the, the lure of Alkali Road is strong. You know, if, if it could lure you fellas that are here and your, and your ladies of, the, of, of today or of then uh, to go out and do some racing, and it, it could lure out this quiet, 
reserve church going choir teacher to raise a renter, then that must be a pretty important part of a piece of road here in Bee County. So, with that, Jim, if you want to go, you've got some more stories to tell from some colleagues that you've talked with. So, it's your turn. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a print guy, so uh, this idea of speaking in front of a bunch of people is uh, a little disconcerting, so uh, put up with me. Uh, the problem is there's no delete key in my mouth. I can't go back and, and start over again. Uh, i talked to a couple of people about racing out uh, at Alkali Road. I had a friend of mine who I used to run with at the Black Hills Sports Car Club, and his name was Cal Augustine. And I was hoping he would be here this afternoon. He's, uh, he's doing some Christmas shopping with his wife, and they had to get some pharmaceutical stuff, and the pharmacy didn't open until 2. Uh, so they're, anyway, they're, uh, they're on their way. Uh, he can have 50 minutes for rebuttal when he gets here. Um, anyway, he, he told me, uh, uh, Dave mentioned the, uh, the highway patrolman, uh, probably thinking that they had, the, uh, they had the advantage when they got out in the open road. Well, Cal told the story about the only time he ever came close to getting caught, and uh, Cal used to run out on the road, he used to run, well, anywhere, anywhere he could find a straight stretch. Uh, with a bunch of other guys, and, and this happened to be out on a little stretch of when Highway 16 used to be just a two-lane road heading south out of Rapids. Uh, down in the valley there where Reptile Gardens is, that was one of their spots. And they picked that because, uh, well, it's uh, depending on the time of day, uh, it was pretty remote back then. They said they would wait until all the tourists got back from the lighting ceremony at Rushmore, and then they kind of had the place to themselves. Uh, late at night, their starting line was on a bridge, concrete, good bite, good bite off the line, nice, cool, damp air, so the cars made a lot of horsepower. Uh, one particular night, he had just got, uh, gotten done, uh, just at the end of the quarter mile, uh, racing a Firebird 400, and he noticed a cop coming down the hill. He said, oh my gosh, they, uh, they've got us dead to rights. Uh, he took off. He said he hot-footed out of there, just pedal to the metal, he had his foot in the carburetor, put up to his decal, and uh, got, back to his, uh, got back to his apartment, um, hid the car, hid the car behind where he was staying, uh, thought he was clear. A couple days later, a cop comes wandering into his place of business. Called, they called him up front, and he, he said, the cop said, uh, look, I know it was you. He said, I'm gonna, uh, I can't write you up because I didn't actually see you do it. But don't do that crap again, is what he said. He said, well, by the way, uh, my car goes, my car will top out at 135 miles an hour, and you were pulling away from me. <laughs> uh, Cal didn't know how fast he was going, but he said, uh, that kind of gave him an idea. Uh, a couple other things that, uh, that I heard, and, and uh, Dave very kindly uh, called me a car guy. Um, my wife is here, she will tell you that I can't tighten the nuts on a fruit cake. So, uh, uh, I think we're, okay, there we go. Uh, I'll try to do this a little better. Like I say, I'm a, I'm a print journalist. I don't know about speaking in front of people. Uh, oh, let's see, I lost my train of thought here. Oh, the thing that Cal mentioned when it comes to, uh, to studying on the car, uh, one of the big things for him was to, uh, to get a set of recap tires for the rear. So they were, they came a little softer compound than the, than the stock white ovals from the year. What, from the year, or Firestone, uh, that, uh, that normally came with vehicles. And you could get a little bit of bite with the, with the recap. Uh, yeah. Anybody have any experience with that, or uh, anybody care to speak on things like that? Anyway. Uh, well, Cal always, uh, Cal told me that they ran, um, oh, Wicksville was another spot, uh, Scenic, Computer, Farmingdale, any stretch of road that uh, offered a straight stretch, and, and they kind of varied it around because, uh, uh, you know, you'd run in a place for a while and there, there'd get to be a good crowd, and somebody would tell the wrong person, and pretty soon the, uh, uh, the local constabulary would show up and uh, shut the place down and you'd have to go somewhere else. Uh, he said the Wicksville was actually shut down by, uh, uh, it was uh, one of the guys that brought his girlfriend with him 
and there had been some, uh, <clears throat> how do I put this, uh, hanky panky after the races, and uh, uh, when she got home, her parents were uh, quite upset. Uh, after questioning, she uh, she finally told where this was happening and uh, what was going on, and, and uh, right after it was right after that that Wicksville got shut down, and uh, everybody had to go somewhere uh, somewhere else. So. Okay. Good for now. Well, one of the things that I had uh, confirmation of from a couple of sources, because uh, we've talked a good bit about law enforcement and the kind of cat and mouse game that went on between the racers and the, the local uh, highway patrol largely, but sheriff's deputies uh, and even occasionally game wardens and the like, was this famed the day of 42 tickets. Is, it, is number 41 here, 39, 17? From that day, there was a... <laughs> there, there was, a, there was a, a race one afternoon that drew a really big crowd of people, and the local law enforcement folks had cooperated amongst themselves, and that they were going to come out and just try to put a maximum amount of influence on all of this sport and fun that was taking place uh, east of town. And so the Highway Patrol, in cooperation with the game wardens and the sheriff's office and the city police, anyone who had the authority to write a ticket, showed up uh, that day and they blocked off both ends of the Alkali Road and everybody there that day got a ticket. So the, the famed day of 42 tickets. I got three. You got three, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that probably bought some cutting edges for the uh, road grader for the, the county or where, where did that money go? You know, it buys basketballs or something. But uh, anyhow, uh, the, the famed day of 42 tickets was one of the factors that closed down uh, the popularity of the racing that was here. Uh, about at the same time, a drag strip in Belfouche was being put together, a commercial. Uh, drag strip there. There's one in Pier, one in Scotts Bluff, and probably elsewhere here in the region that all of a sudden gave a, a different venue for this kind of racing and a place for spectators to sit and all of that. Uh, it was interesting in my visit with Terry Mays because uh, we talked about, he didn't tell me the story of the 42 tickets, but uh, we talked a good bit about that and he said that uh, in the 60s and into the early 1970s, there wasn't a state ordinance uh, that they could write a ticket against for side-by-side -side racing. Uh, you could get a ticket for illegal parking, uh, going too fast, or something else, but racing per se just wasn't in the statute books until the, the legislature changed that and created the prohibition or the, the mechanism, the legal mechanism, against uh, exhibition driving. And once that started, that was further emphasis to, uh, well, just take your car to the drag strip, pay your fee or whatever it was. And the, the free game all of a sudden outside of town started to diminish. So I've got one more picture here and then we're going we're gonna to ask for... So I, I interviewed... I interviewed several old timers, uh, old timers, uh, uh, gentlemen of my age, uh, about well, where's it going today? Where does racing take place? And I was assured by uh, at least some people that yes, it still does take place. But the, certainly the the era, the time, our time of the muscle car, of a lot of noise, of a lot of horsepower, uh, the excitement making your car go fast for a quarter mile on a state highway uh, has largely diminished. And now it's just a lot of noise. And so if you take your Toyota Camry or your little Honda or your little Kia and uh, tune it up a little bit, it'll make noise, but that's kind of about it. Uh, nothing replaces Gary Patterson's acoustical weapon that he had with his 58 Chevy and, uh, and however the exhaust system of that car worked or didn't work. But I know that one lap up and down Main Street was all I could stand and I had to get up. And so 
it was uh, more rumbling than I, my, my rib cage could handle. So, anyway, with so many people here today, and this is, this exceeds our expectation by a great deal, I'm sure. I appreciate all of you, one, for talking with me early on, if we talked on the telephone or in person, uh, and then for showing up here this afternoon. The little worksheet that's got the names of the, uh, the cars and drivers that we, could, we were able to find uh, you know, over the course of about a month of doing research. Uh, we'll collect those and just add them to the body of knowledge. Now it's time for anyone here in the audience who's got a story to tell. Maybe there's a grudge that isn't settled yet. Uh, you've brought evidence that you really did win in 1967. And uh, the tires, or you brought the linkage from your Hearst uh, shifter uh, to show everyone to prove. I know we have somewhere here, uh, Jerry Burnham's family has brought a couple of artifacts uh, in the back, uh, jackets from <laughs> The car clubs uh, that existed uh, during the time when Jerry was a young man and, and uh, uh, racing, and so this is the Corvette Club of Sturgis, and, <laughs> and, uh, and the coachman. I've I've talked to some Rapid City fellows who uh, who speak very very fondly of the counts of the cobblestone as one of the two or three oldest continuously operating car clubs in the nation. Uh, the Council of the Cobblestone, they have been holding regular meetings, uninterrupted, or consecutive meetings, uh, for 60 plus years, and still going strong. And so, there was also a club in Rhapsody called the Shifters, and the third one, the name of the club has escaped my head all of a sudden. But their Rapid City had three clubs. I believe there was a, car, a club in the Denver area and elsewhere. And so in the 1960s, the car club culture was another very important part of our lifestyle. The way you uh, showed off your colors, as it were, in those days. To have that cast aluminum plaque on your license plate or bolted on your fender uh, was the way to show everybody that, hey, here comes a count, or a coachman, or what have you. So, if there are folks that I would hope that, you know, please don't be shy. Here's your opportunity. Anyone who's got something to add to my uh, inch deep, mile wide knowledge uh, of cars and Jim's stories from his friend that he has, why, here's an opportunity for you to add to the afternoon and uh, set the record straight. So. If anyone wants something to say, there are people here I know who are, are accomplished racers with lots of burning rubber uh, left behind them. So, uh, who, who's going to be brave enough? Now, does this take a challenge? That was in the 60s, the Coachman Club, when we were in high school and a little bit after. So, uh, Any ideas? In, in the co are any nominations from the audience about who would have been the coachman car club of Sturgis? Was, was that Gerald Lane and Jerry Burnham? And the fellows that were just a little bit older than me, uh, who would have been uh, Ron Wise? He had one of the Corvettes in town. Uh, the, uh, other stories. There's got to be at least one. One blown clutch. One traffic ticket that you're still paying on, maybe. Or, or the, tra the traffic ticket that, that sparked somebody to go to law school and uh, never suffer that it didn't again. I, I, uh, I'm from Belfouche, but Burn Bells, class of 65 in Belfouche. And because Jim opened the door on Calvin August. I don't know if there was ever a crazier uh, individual that had a fast car than I know of. I spent some time with him as my roommate, which was a scary time. But I just want to relate to uh, this individual. If he shows up, he'll, he'll own this. But he, he wrecked my car, <laughs> and he kept his car back. He bought a 1968 Cobra Jet 428. 
front a key for drove it up to at that time Kmart, parked way away from everybody, went and bought floor mats for him. Gonna keep it nice. As he was coming back with the floor mats, a lady pulled up beside him way out in the parking lot and stayed away from everybody. If you have been to Kmart that that uh, parking lot's on the hillside. She opened her door and slammed it to the passenger side of the brand new Burgundy 428 Golden Jet Mustang. He said, I'm so mad. He says, I got in the driver's side, I reached over, I unlashed the door, which she'd already picked, and he said, I kicked it into her car, put a big tap in her door, and he said, like, oh, he says, how's that feel? <laughs> Took it back down to the Ford dealer, got the door fixed. But that guy, Crazy. You've heard of Billy Baker, I think you probably. And if you have on the interstate, racing Billy Baker, and just Calvin running, not running the highway patrol, would be exactly right. It never let off. I mean, even if he was getting beat, you just keep on until if he thought there was any chance. Ron Sports and Baker, those kind of guys, and Calvin was always game for racing. You talk about coming down out of the uh, Ripped out guard, he didn't race down the road in the Rapid City, rather than could be, just keep racing. But uh, we talked about then the street racing. Uh, Larry Foose brought up the fact that the Center Nation car called the Bell, we were kind of, uh, I'm trying to think when we started exactly, but around the 60s, 70, 60, late, early 70s, we had walkie talkies, and uh, they talked about the uh, street racing out north of Bell. One night we had over 100 cars, and we had walkie-talkies, but the cops came anyway, and I gave tickets to everybody that was parked in the ditch. They didn't give any tickets for drag racing, but everybody got <laughs> tickets for parking in the ditch. So those days, uh, let's see. Uh, and then out by Union Center, we used to, I know we attended a couple places, a couple races out there where we walked out just this side of Union Center and have a long Sunday afternoon. Let the ranchers go through occasionally. <laughs> so, Sturgis uh, and Val leave that with, it's, it's great. One of the guys that's always there, Rod uh, Petronic, he, he's got a couple of stories he can probably share. And then we'll let the, both of the guys take it over. Kenny Lee's being pretty quiet over there. He's got to know some of this. Legends of uh, Alkali Flats. Some to the list is Ronnie Thorson. He's deceased now. 62 Chevy Bell Air Black, 409, 409. John Mazika, 66 Olds, 442 Big Black W30. Billy Baker had the 66 Chevy Biscayne, 427. I think Sonny Mazika, who's now passed away, had a 64 Plymouth. 426 wedge. Larry Foose is sitting here. And, uh, I don't remember his 64 Plymouth Sport Fury 383, but I do remember his 67 Hornet RT convertible. Uh, I had a 67 396 Chevelle. Larry Russell's was deceased, who was from Newell, ran a 64 Pontiac GTO with a big white one. Can't think of anything uh, else. Uh, we added Lee Bentley. He was our nice highway patrolman at Belfouche. I didn't add Keith Christensen. He used to get so damn mad his face was as red as pork to pig. He was trying to talk to Lee about writing us all tickets to take us to jail. But he, Lee just told him to calm down and get in the car. Because so, Lee had one officer superior over him. Um, I probably left off some people. I recognize a lot of these names. Lynn Franz is deceased. He had a Mustang. But I couldn't uh, uh, think of uh, what it was. Rusty Revere probably didn't tell you. He had several nice cars. When we raced out north one day in 085, Ronnie Thorson had a very fast 68 442 called Weather Scout. And uh, Revere always showed up with nice cars. They were really nice cars, but they were fast. Well, Rusty Revere showed up with this 
68 Camaro 396, 375 horse. And it was pretty fast, but it wasn't fast enough to beat Thor's 68 W30. And that's just some of the racing things, the stories, you know. And I came on the scene at Alkali Flats in the late 60s, 67, 68, and 9. I guess they started in the 50s, and we probably left out a lot of people. And uh, anyway, I was out of Belfouche today, I'm out of Newcastle, so why don't we? Anyway, thank you. How much did the cars cost? Uh, 396 Chevelles were $28 to $3,200. Then they got more Camaros were about $3,500 to $3,800. Uh, the 442s were up around $3,500 to $4,000. Uh, I don't know what the Plymouths were. Larry, what did your 67 RT convertible cost? Very rare. 3700 they were very rare cars, big red convertible, 440 automatic. Uh, White top. Um, and as Bird talked about, Calvin Alphys, Augustine, he had a sleeper, 68 428 Overjet, because in those days there wasn't any emblems on that car, it just said Mustang GT. But you could tell by the big exhaust in the back, it was bigger than 390. And that car was very much a street sleeper. Uh, Billy Baker. Fame for big block Chevys. That Biscayne, he had a 66 black Biscayne 427 four quarters. And he always prided himself about having strip oil models, big block Chevys. And he had that car. And he's a long time been deceased too. But I'll quit here and somebody else wants to Well, it, what, uh, we talked a little bit about the money and the competition and how diverse the racing was, not just on alkali but elsewhere here in the region. Where did the mechanical work get done? It all couldn't have been done at the Baker garage out uh, at their farm, although I, I think a good bit of wrench turning was done uh, at, at the Baker place. Uh, your, your reputation of you and your brothers and your cousins is uh, far and wide as being good wrench turners, good fabricators of things. Uh, is there someone here who would like to talk a little bit about the, getting the car ready or taking care of it. Was this something you just did under a shade tree? I don't think so. Uh, did you do it in the barn, in a garage? Uh, where did all this magic happen? I just want to give a shout out to uh, Kenny Bates and Bob Schaffner. It used to be an art mobile station over here where the Loud House is now, and uh, that was kind of the hangout of a lot of people. Uh, and they, they, of course, they had all all of those guys had cars, the performance type cars, and uh, that's where a lot of the work was done that I was around anyhow. And, where did the knowledge come from? Oh, the knowledge came from uh, the School of Hard Knocks, a lot of it, <laughs> or Hot Rod magazines and whatnot, you know, because there, there wasn't, much, wasn't much technology in those days. <coughs> so so you, you learned from your dads, your uncles, you experimented on your own? A cousin or a friend or Billy Baker and those guys, you know, these Baker brothers, of course, they were, they were innovators. They, they were ahead of the game back then. We know how much the cars cost. Did everybody have three jobs to sustain this? Or, uh, my little job at the Pickly Wiggly barely put gas in my dad's ramp. So uh, the, uh, was, was, it a, was it a big money sport? It might, might be today. Or the notion that I have anyway, that you see a, a fancy car go down the road today that it's <coughs> Well, um, most of the guys race their cars that they drove. You know, if my first race car was a 55 Chevy four door, and that was our family car, the wife and the kids would go out and stand by the side of the road while I did my thing. <laughs> but 
But anyhow, somebody else can take this and talk. It's not that bad. <laughs> Okay, other, there, there's got to be someone here who's got a, a story to tell of, of, a, of a competition itself. What it was like to be in the car, uh, your foot on the gas and your other foot on the clutch and, and getting ready to go challenge either your, your hated enemy or maybe your buddy or your brother. So, this racing started back in the day, but the racing happened even into the 90s. We had quite rivals against Rapid City, the Sturgis group against Rapid City group, and whose car was fastest. Uh, Bruce Bradley was involved in that. Uh, Scott Heibel, Jason Zilstra, me, uh, Jesse Blakeman. We had multiple people with fast cars racing out on Outlier Road. Um, to crowds of well over 100 people lining the ditches the whole way to mile, both sides of the road. Um, we had a big race from Rapid City coming up. They came up on trailers. Uh, we got confronted in McDonald's parking lot by Sturgis PD that if anybody went through the S-curves, we were getting tickets. That race never happened. <laughs> But there's multiple occasions of being out there and getting busted. Um, police coming up, it happened to be that two of the four cars that were there were broke. As the officer pulled up, he asked what was going on and we looked at him and said, would you believe car troubles? <laughs> <laughs> All four cars out there had slicks on. <laughs> But that changed when Steve Berry started, opened up Sturgis Dragway to be able to race out there. I quit racing out there and, and racing Sturgis Dragway on, on an every weekend basis. So that's where things are at today. Story, anybody else have a story here? We're, we're coming up on an hour and, and it's... Uh, Sunday afternoon, or what, no, what day is today? Saturday, yeah, Saturday. Yeah. yeah, we haven't been here that long. Uh, anyone else have an un unfinished business here? I, I do want to thank uh, Richard Miller in the back for he is making a videotape of the presentation today. And that again becomes part of the archive of what the Sturgis Mead County Hist Historical Society does. And we've got, oh, another story, good. I just have a question for anyone that raced back then who still has their car. Okay. okay. What, what, are, what are your cars? Okay. And Don? Oh, you have that car yet. Okay. <laughs> Other cars still in existence? You have, you have a 65 Fastback Mustang, okay. The one of ninety-five Monte Carlo. Those are these are saving bonds, savings bonds that you guys have got. Just keep them. Uh, one of uh, one of uh, we class of sixty-five uh, people who are here this afternoon. One of our classmates uh, went to the Air Force Academy and. His graduation present to himself was a Shelby Mustang. And uh, up until at least a few years ago, I got a ride in that car, kind of just untouched, keeps it in his garage. And he said that's just a little investment he's tucked away. And so uh, uh, those of you that have still been able to hold on to your cars, uh, you know, there, there's not only there's the cash value, I suppose, of what they are as a collector, but there's an enormous amount of sentimental value in that car. You're just not gonna, you're not gonna give it up. So, uh, anything more from? Yes. It was green. 
Still green, okay, a Falcon Sprint. Hello. Oh, okay. <laughs>
just as they took off towards Wyoming, sat in the middle of the street, highway in the dark, damn near got ran over by the highway patrol. <laughs> He's going to try to outrun him to Wyoming. Jim Jacobson pulled over right away. Art pulled over a little bit later. <laughs> but they both got tickets and sent home. Uh, but see that on there? And, and the race was over more or less before it began, uh, began because of the lights coming on as soon as they took off. But don't stand in the middle of the road after the race gets started to get ran over. <laughs> That's how it feels. Alrighty, well, once again, I thank everyone for coming out here this afternoon. I invite you to stay as long as you wish. I don't know if I'm the bar closest, but uh, you'll be here for a while. No, you're here all night. Okay. At the piano player at the Holiday Inn. Yeah, I'm just here all night. So. Um, anyway, thank you again. Uh, fill out the little sheets. If you've got other things you want to come up and talk to me about or Tim Holland. Uh, as well, we'll collect information for this and we'll get it all cooked into one uh, pot and uh, turn it into a story that will be part of the archive of the Historical Society. So again, thank you. Travel safely home. Uh, if you're like me, you've got a Medicare card in your pocket. Uh, you know, check with your doctor before you spin your tires. So uh, we want everybody to, to have a safe journey home and uh, a nice holiday. So thanks again for coming.